we're going to move to the next speaker. Next speaker. Here you go. Do you have a mic? Do you have a mic? Yes. Okay. I want to move the rest of the room. I got this. You got some of the Yes. Okay, so we have the second speaker today. It's uh, Pranav Shah. Yeah. Yeah. A short characterization yeah. of the Rotavirus Assembly Pathway featured using pilot tomography. Yeah. Thank you. So yeah, uh, I'm, I'm really pleased to be here because project was something of, a, of an interest for me for ever since I did, did my studies in virology, but somehow I got stuck with eukaryotic viruses. So not as cool as bacteria patients, I, I say that. Uh, but anyway, so uh, I'm, I'm a, I'm a, a postdoctoral research and data research group at Truby, and in the group I'm interested in studying uh, or understanding the assembly processes of viruses. In this case, uh, we started with rotavirus. Um, just to give you a sense, rotavirus is a complicated piece of molecular machinery. It has three concentric protein layers that enclose a, a multi-segmented double-stranded RNA genome. And within the core, we also have then the viral transcription and capping enzymes. And these three cores, oh, sorry, these three protein layers sort of stack up on, uh, on top of each other uh, and result in, and, and right on the outside of the uh, infectious virion, we have the spike protein. Uh, please um, bear with me. I'm just going to refer to the spike. Nothing to do with COVID, obviously. Uh, so, um, the best way I can think of uh, thinking about this particle is this testudo formation uh, that the Romans used to use uh, back in ancient times. So it's a, it's a molecular machine optimized for both offense and defense uh, at the same time. Um, the life cycle is fairly, uh, uh, I mean, as, as is the case for uh, most viruses, attachment entry. Unlike uh, many eukaryotic viruses, though, uh, the double standard RNA genome, the parent genome, remains in the particle. It is transcribed from the particle, uh, a viral mRNA is transcribed from the particle, which gets translated, results in the formation of virus factories, where uh, subsequent stages of, um, um, subsequent, uh, stages of um, genome amplification, virus assembly, and packaging takes place. Somewhat interestingly, there is this transiently enveloped stage in the in the maturation or the assembly stages of the virus, and then the virus exits the cell. So, for this uh, study, we were obviously interested in uh, trying to understand all these stages inside the cell. Now, traditionally, the way we study uh, virus assembly so, uh, is the naive approach: crack open a whole bunch of cells, run it on a gradient, see what sticks, and then look at it in microslogophy or CAR-EM these days. Uh, but this approach, as you can, I mean, what's immediately obvious is only the stuff that survives the purification process is amenable to being studied, right? Uh, so you can take the next approach and you can cut open a few cells and see what's inside. And that way, uh, and the only way you can visualize that is by, you know, using heavy atom stains and stuff. And what you then get is this sort of a picture where you're then left to interpret, uh, you know, map these results into this. And there is a lot of loss of information and there's a lot of interpretation that goes in and there's a very little direct evidence. But recently a technology has emerged, when I say recent, it's probably like seven or eight years old, that's five, six years old, correct me if I'm wrong. But what, what we do in here is that we grow cells on gold grids. Gold is non-cytotoxic. We rapidly freeze them in liquid ethane. And then we stick them in, a, in an STM that is equipped with a cryo stage and a focused ion beam. And this technology is known as um, focused ion beam milling. It's a, it's a technique that we sort of adapted from material science um, field. And, these, uh, and I'm just going to quickly play you a movie of what happens when, um, when, when we ablate uh, cells and generate lamella inside this microscope. So, uh, let me see if that works. All right, so here you have cells growing on grids. Uh, there's, there's two of them. And the same, same cell side view, and we have these patterns, and we just start ablating material away using these uh, beam, beam of focus sign. And what this results in is in really uh, thin lamella that are around 150 to 200 nanometers thick. And you learn more about this and give us talk uh, later in the uh, conference. 
But these lamella are now amenable to uh, imaging in a prior PM. Uh, and what, what happens there is we basically collect projections at fixed angles and then reconstruct those uh, 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 tilt series into a 3D volume known as a tomogram, and you saw some of those in Nicola's talk. And, uh, and here's an example of the, uh, that I have where you almost every stable intermediate of the family is captured in a single volume. So, uh, what at this point it is, uh, it's clear that pixel for pixel there's way more information in these images than in this one. I'm not, I'm, I mean, these have been, these studies have been incredibly powerful to help us understand how these basic processes take place, and we are just taking it into high gear with, with the technology that we are now using and applying. So, in, in Zonovirus Infected Cells, we were in, immediately able to discern four intermediates. Two of the four are pretty well known. These are the double layer particle of DLP and the triple layer particle of the TLP because they survive the purification process. The transiently enveloped stage has been observed, but it has never been molecularly characterized or structurally characterized because you can't purify it. And uh, this indented uh, single layer particle, although has been seen for other viruses, has never been seen for rotavirus. So for the purpose of, purpose of this talk, I'm going to just highlight some of the salient features of these three intermediates uh, over here. So let's start with the single layer particle. Uh, it was really striking for me personally to see this particle because it, it has this unusual uh, morphology. It has dimples at the five poles and very prominent blobs uh, at, the, uh, at these five poles. But the stage, and, uh, stage experts in the community will not be surprised to see this intermediate. I mean, um, Sarah and Dennis Bamford groups have uh, described five, six, and five intermediates before. And recently, our group also showed this intermediate for Rio virus. Um, and now, so what this all uh, means is that this indented form is kind of conserved among the whole double stranded RNA virus family. family. Um, what what our, our intermediate had with the others don't, which are these prominent uh, densities of the fivefold, and we had very low resolution, so we couldn't really interpret those results uh, through the structure alone. So we had to, what, but what we did happen to have is a, uh, is a temperature sensitive mutant in the lab that has a defect in the polymerase. And when you grow the virus at non permissive temperatures, it, it ends up not, um, it, ends, it assembles to completion, but it does not package the genome. And, and if you look at the early stages, um, there is a, an 80% decrease in the intensity of these blobs at the five fold. And we, assume, we therefore assign this density tentatively to the polymerase uh, protein. This is all very low resolution, and this is, of course, something that we need to. Uh, that we are actively investigating at this point in time, uh, and of, of course we want to try and improve the resolution. But these are fairly rare species, so it's very challenging to find them, and plus, because you can't verify them, it's even harder. So, let's, I'm going to switch over to the envelope double layer particle. Like I said, it lacks some structural characterization, there's a lot of biochemical evidence out there, and we can finally start, we can see this particle and describe what's happening over there. So, for the most part, it's almost disappointingly boring in, 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 the, in the strongest features, and that, that it is like almost exactly like the, uh, the double layer particle, which, yeah, it's a rock. But what it does, where it differs, is in the presence of these really uh, delicate feathers that feather the particle to the limiting membrane. And if you look at the location of these uh, trichotal densities, they appear in the same place where the virus spike protein is, but it, that, that uh, envelope or that density looks nothing like the spike protein. What it does have, though, is, is a foot. I mean, we can sort of segment this uh, density into three, uh, three parts. We've got the foot domain, the crust, and the lobes, which then connect the membrane. So, because the virus, uh, because this density occurred in the place where the viral spike protein lived, we ju I just docked in the, the mature spike, and there was pretty good correspondence in the foot domain, but beyond that, 
there's absolutely no correspondence with the, uh, with the metro form and what we were observing. Um, I won't get into the details, but there was a lot of curious 3D classification that lasted, I don't know, six and a half, seven months. And we came up, and I finally found a few classes where we, I could interpret the density and assign a, a novel confirmation to this density. And now we have a model for a premature form of the, of the spike. So I didn't explain the structure of the spike, and I will do that right now. It has um, the head domain, so this is the red stuff here. The trunk domain, which is involved in uh, perforating the core and, and uh, transporting the uh, transcription reactor double layer particle into the cell. And then there's the foot domain where all of this is. And, oh, and this is the confirmation that we uh, proposed in the paper that we put out recently. So finally, we have the triple layer particle. This is the infectious form. And generally, the way it is studied is you grow the virus in the presence of trypsin. Trypsin activates the virus because it's an enteric virus that we have proteases in our gut. And that's required to, um, uh, to activate the virus. So the only structures that we have, well, not the only, but the only high resolution structures that we have up, on, up until now are of thymotrypsin or trypsin digested variants, but not of the pre, you know, the intracellular form. So, because we did, we applied, we did spectrum of uh, we got a pretty high resolution in this, uh, in this, uh, for the species because we had the, they were the most represented in the data sets that I collected. And uh, what that enabled us to see, well, again, kind of disappointing. It looked exactly like what was known. Um, but it was a good confirmation. This is one of the highest resolution maps um, that we had until two months ago for in situ data. Um, but because the high resolution afforded a, a very interesting view of the spike protein. We had this extra domain that was not, pre that was not present in any of the reconstructions of the spike from, uh, from particles that have been purified. And, but, and again, I won't get into the details, but we ran a lot of other confirmatory tests, and we were able to assign the density to the third copy of the head domain, which again was never, had never been observed in any other reconstructions up until now. So that brings me to my conclusion. I'm just going to paraphrase uh, them over here. So spectromogram averaging of infected cells resulted in the identification and characterization of novel assembly intermediates. Um, not only that, we were, able, I was, uh, we were able to expand the confirmational repertoire of the uh, VP4 spike protein because this is this is a segment of my imagination. It's just a linear interpolation between two states that we have. We don't, so the transitions are not real. It's my disclaimer. But we, we were able to characterize these two forms of, of, the, of, the, um, of the viral protein. Again, these forms would have been inaccessible to study using conventional method, and that's the power that Institute Tomography affords. I think this is the start of something beautiful. Uh, there are more questions that we would like to answer, especially pertaining to the ones that relate, uh, pertaining to the early, very early stages. How does the SIP form? How, uh, whether it's on the pathway, what are the, how does the polymerase get into the, in, and how does the genome get into the particle? These are all questions that we are now trying to address. And I think they're also, not only can we address them, but I think they're accessible. We can now make an attempt to try and understand these, uh, uh, answer these questions. And then secondly, as I mentioned, we have this internal entry event, if you will, where the virus goes, but it transiently envelops, goes into the ER membrane, and then leaves the, uh, it leaves the cell. So in, in the life cycle, you think that all the stages occur in one direction from, you know, entry to exit, but here we have some stages sort of repeating themselves. So we, uh, we want to better understand the stages, the stages which um, drive the maturation of the spike from this primary confirmation to the upright confirmation. Um, I come to the end of my talk. Uh, this, it took a village as, uh, to get this project off the ground and into a journal. Uh, most, uh, I want to thank Mark, who is the biologist. He's the functional extension of, of my computational self. Um, Dave, obviously, for um, hiring all the right kind of people. Uh, Ebit for data collection. And these are the computer, uh, the computer experts who, who were kind enough to, you know, 
share the skills with me and train me up. And I thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take questions. Perfect timing. Yes, please. So, questions. Very nice talk. So, in terms of the prokaryotic like particles, so in basic, whatever you do to any of the proteins affects the whole assembly. Mm. So, saying that it's polymerase because you get reduced density when you have a TSP that is pretty far. Well, I mean, like I said, I'm not tied to, I'm not tying myself to that pole, uh, but we had to interpret that density at the time, and we had only 27 particles in the data. Right, and polymerase is found inside particles. It is inside the particles, so it has to go in somehow. Yeah, okay. His work is sort of do you think it's a sort of packaging intermediate? And if yes, do you see any block of like this, uh, this assortment complex of RNA that should be very dense, uh, which should be somewhere in there to um, select the segments? If, if I can just have the slide so up. So here's a mutant that we, uh, there's another mutant in the lab that we have which fails to package the uh, up at the, out, the intermediate layer. And inside, we have very strong amorphous density. Almost every particle has this density. But it's a mutant, so it needs to be characterized uh, more deeply than just saying that all BP6 fails to assemble. But yeah, it would be very interesting to see what, what, what the identity of these uh, densities is. So, in a way, I agree with you perhaps that probably nucleic acid, but be, I don't know. Exactly, they've expanded as well. So, how all of this happens, it's, it's still not known, but we are trying to understand this process. Okay, more questions? No? Okay, more one. Can you make particles without that density that you're assigning to the polymerase? Can I make. Um, the reason I ask is, is related how you, the inner shells are going to get but all the other shells are. Because of heat and having that density pop up the dimple. So, the dimple would be the next layer to be an icosahedron rather than a contactee. Yeah, so uh, the only, I mean, this was the best we could do in, in making the virus without the polymerase or reduced polymerase. But uh, I think we can come up with experiments where it could, you know, silence the, uh, silence the expression. You can't make the virus in the absence. You can't you can't touch it structurally. But in general, what why the you know, the inner layer is the tetrahedron, but then the outer is the icosahedron. I think it's like the icosahedron for me instead of the dim That's a tetrahedron. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's a tetrahedron. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right, we're going to move to the next part. It's uh, Gabriela Condenso. Condenso. Yeah, and uh, she's going to present high resolution structure, the first isolated polymer like virus. The body like between bacteriophages and eukaryotic viruses in the PRD1 like lineage. Okay, thank you. Hi, everybody. Thanks for this opportunity to show you uh, my work. Um, oh. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the PRD1 lineage is a, a structural lineage where the major capsule protein of this virus goes in a two beta bubble. So you can see. Oh my god. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. Okay. Two beta bubbles in green, and in blue one, B2, uh, B1 and B2. Uh, they are called also the double jetty roll. The, the members of, of these lineages infect the three domains, bacteria, eukarya, and archaea. They belong to the Marina area, and today I will focus on the Marina kingdom. The members of this kingdom uh, contain a double strand DNA and follow um, 
are both using this uh, folding that the double jagged roll. It has been proposed that the eukaryotic bias of these linears come from effective values very similar to PR1. And the intermediate step in the evolution uh, is the polytons. From this point emerges the video pages, the megaviruses, and adenovirus. But what is the polytons? The polytons are the DNA transposable elements. The size is around 50 20 kilobytes per. They are integrated into the eukaryotic genome from the maples to vertebrates. And they contain a uh, protein prime DNA polymerase and retrovirus like interviews. For this reason, they are called polymers. Also, contain a uh, PRD1 in packaging ATPs and adenovirus like moderation proteins. And also, they have a possible structure protein, major amino coxid protein, and the folding could be a double jelly roll in the case of the major capsid protein and a single jelly roll in the case of the minor capsid protein. But we don't know if in certain conditions they can, uh, the DNA could be expressed and, and produce billions. In, in metagenomic study ha, has been found a sequence very similar to the polytons. They are called polyton like values because they don't contain the interviews, proteins, and in some cases, polymerase. In 2015, uh, the group of Gunnar Rabba uh, discovered a new virus, PSV1. This virus infects a unicellular IG. The genome of this virus is a double strand DNA. The genome is around 26 kilobase per, and the di diameter is 69 nanometers. 68, sorry. Um, the genome of this virus has a picture very, uh, uh, of the polyton like virus, so this, is, this virus, PSV1, will be the first isolated polyton like virus. In mass spec, we detect uh, 12 proteins, so this is a complex virus. In a previous map, uh, five amps per hour resolution, we determined the triangulation number, in this case is 21. Only three uh, bios have this triangulation number. They are phases and belong to the WGL unit. Now we have a better uh, resolution, 2.7 amps, and we trace the major capsid protein. Uh, this uh, protein contains two beta bubbles. And also, we can compare with another member of this lineage. We have the same calculation number, 21. This is PM2. You can see that the, the proteins are different, often they have the same calculation number. But the, this protein is very similar to another member of this lineage, PVC1, who infects green algae also. And you can see that the structure is very similar, although the triangulation number is different. And you can see that this protein has the same size, more or less, but constructs different capsules. Okay, uh, if we look carefully at the folding of this uh, major capsule protein, it's very similar to PVC1 and adenovirus, and also concerns um, special structures. For example, this uh, basal alpha helix is present in Fausto virus and in this virus, and also in Archaea. The equivalent of this alpha helix in bacteria is not concerned, it's moving in different loops. And also, this second alpha helix in this loop is present in all the members of the eukaryotic virus and also in video pages. And finally, this strand is concerned in this virus or also in bacteria, in bacteria scaffold. Are uh, in the video pages. Okay, we trace the major capsid protein, G this is the GP5, and also we trace the vertex protein, GP11. If we compare GP11 with other um, members of these lineages, you can see that it's very similar to adenovirus, Sputnik, and uh, Mavirus, Mavirus, sorry. Um, it's is completely different in bacteria and archaea, often they all contain a single jelly roll in this area. So, in conclusion, we can say that the, this virus, aunque have the same triangulation number than the bacterial pages, the major capsid and the vertex proteins look like a eukaryotic virus. 
Also, we found um, a stratensity in the inner capsule They is located in some in these areas of in the asymmetric unit. We have placed a model of this density, and you can still see the density of these proteins, uh, how many amino acids have been present for each one. We compare this, uh, sorry, <laughs> this protein network with PM2. You can see that this is different. We will focus right now in the triple axis. You can see in the case of TSBN1, we have almost two proteins in, in that blue and cyan. And there, there is another protein because we are not identified is in yellow one. But it is really, really high the reinforcement in this virus if we compare with PM2. We have three copies of the same protein, T3. If we compare with uh, PRD1, there is no uh, uh, protein, there is not any reinforcement in the triple axis, we can see here. Now we will focus on the triple axis. In the case of PSV1, the reinforcement is in a vertical direction, in PM2 is in a horizontal direction, but in PRD1 is in the same direction, the vertical. And also you can observe this, um, this protein close to the high pole axis is the same in TSB1. You can see better in, in this picture, in the, the protein uh, P16 uh, is located in the high pole axis. In the case of uh, TSB1, is P22. But in PM2, there is no any protein in this position. In, uh, for PD, PRD1, this protein down towards to the core of, of, the, of the particle. In the case of TSB1, is completely flat. The only protein down towards to the core is GP4, is located in the triple axis. You can see that most of the proteins that connect with the core of the particle, because the PRD1 and PM2 is longer than the TSB1. So the question is, what is inside of this particle? So inside of this particle, we can observe these rings, but these rings also appear in all the bacteria features of this lineage, like a PRD1. In the case of PRD1, the first two rings correspond to internal membrane, but we don't know if this virus contains an uh, internal membrane. What is the evidence to support this idea that contains an internal membrane? Well, the most of the members of this lineage have one, except adenovirus and Sputnik. In mass spec, we detect a, a protein who has high probability of membrane domain, and also this virus is sensitive to the chloroform treatment. Of them, uh, uh, this is not necessarily implied that this virus contains an internal membrane. So we did a student black stain to detect the lipids in, in the sample. This compound uh, staining the lipids, and you can see here this is a mix of the lipids and cholesterol. Uh, we detect signal here, and also for the sample, but not for our virus and for adenovirus. Adenovirus doesn't contain an internal membrane. We repeat this experiment using a, another positive control. In this case, it's a coronavirus. We detect signal for this coronavirus and also for the host, but not for TSV1 and adenovirus. So, in conclusion, uh, TSV1 doesn't contain an internal membrane. So, all these rings that we observe here correspond to the genome. If we look carefully at this, uh, uh, this picture, you can see that the thickness of this capsis is different. The thick, uh, TSV1 is, more, is thicker than the PRD1, and also the genome is longer than PRD1, although they have more or less the same size. So we, uh, this suggests that the genome inside of this virus is really, really confident. So one way to compare uh, this picture uh, in a qualitative, uh, quantitative uh, way is calculating the packing fraction. The packing fraction is the vacuum between the volume that is occupied by the DNA and the capsule internal volume. So we calculate this number for this virus is 0.63. If we compare this value with the other members of this lineage, and also another one, Concord 97, who has the record for this 
satisfaction, you can see that PSD1 has the higher value inside of this limit, but not if we compare with the Hong Kong 87. So this is the concentration of the, the DNA inside of the capsule. We can conclude that the PSD1 has um, the packing function on this virus is the highest reported for a virus in the PRD1 like limit. Um, this uh, value could, could suggest that uh, instead of this particle, there is a high internal pressure. For this reason, uh, could be, this could be the explain why this virus has a thicker capsule and also has a very complex uh, protein network um, to, yeah, very complex network. In conclusion, uh, uh, the polyintermite virus belongs to the double jelly roll because the major capsid protein falls in a, falls in two beta bubbles and the TSB1 is similar to the bacteria features uh, in key number but However, the, um, the myocapsid protein and the vector protein looks more similar than eukaryotic virus. The TSD1 doesn't have an um, internal membrane, and this virus has the highest packing factor reported in a low regular role lead. And the, there is a complex myocapsid protein network in, in this virus. Um, thank you for your attention. Nice talk. Uh, did you have any sign of a uh, spike on this protein? The spike? Uh, not really. Uh, when we did uh, the, the reconstruction, we observed a little bit a uh, uh, spike, but it's more similar like a fiber of adenovirus. But uh, right now, we are, are not focused in, in, in the blood test. Uh, but we try to do in, in, in the fiction and uh, make a focus only in the practice to see this kind of five, possible fiber. So in the case of um, uh, cytomegalovirus and some of these others with a high packing density of DNA, there's a portal and there's a motor pushing the DNA inside. Is that the case? For, as far as I know, this is not the case for the PRD1 virus. Yeah, we don't How know. Do such a high density of DNA inside? Yeah, we don't know what is the mechanism to uh, inject the, the, the DNA, but we suppose it very could be similar to the... Well, of, so the adenovirus is it sort of condensed around the uh, DNA that's covered in protein. Ah, you say the assembly protein. Assembly protein. Right. The assembly. The assembly of this particle, you say that. Yes, uh, if you put again in the, in the presentation, please. Yeah, we are working uh, in, in cellular section and also we are preparing some uh, the construction of the cell using a system. So we try to analyze the, the particles that is contained in the nucleus because this virus assembly inside of the nucleus like an adenovirus. So uh, when we look for uh, the structure of the, the virus, oh, sorry, this one. Okay, <laughs> this one. Uh, it looks like uh, the capsule follow follow the constructor um, assembly, like a uh, adenovirus, but this is only preliminary uh, study. So we try to to check the structure in, in more detail using this technique and also lamellas in, in the in the picture. So we see. And also we are. I collaborated with uh, Pedro de, de, de Pablo to analyze the me mechanical properties of this virus. Uh, hi. So my question is related to that, that if you break the symmetry, you can see some special work or something. Yeah, uh, we are planning to do it in the future. Yeah, yeah. and another question about those internal problems that you said. They, they are just like on the surface, they're not going inside. So like the whole sequence of those problems could be modeled over where they're like, Chunks of rescue were just invisible. Uh, oh, no. Well, uh, we say we say uh, 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 I think that the five proteins, but not in totally 
um, sequence. So we expect, uh, we, we think that the, the most of the protein also there are uh, really, really positive pro protein in the, the, is down connect to the bio, uh, to the gen genome. So it's not visible for us. So we suspected that there is the connection between the CACTI and, 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 the, and, and the genome. But there are another protein has been detected in mass spec, but we, no, we are not tracing yet. It's not possible to trace them. Okay, thank you. Um, um, in regards to packaging and how it's sensitive, I noticed in your annotation of the proteins that were in the polyton there was a, a, something annotated in your slide as a packaging ATPA. So, what's, yeah. so is that really a packaging ATPA yeah. or is it just sort of built by uh, association? <laughs> Yeah, well, I think that it ha happened the same than, than adenovirus because adenovirus has a HPA also, but then the um, assembly pathway uh, is concentrated in a concentrated way. So why is this virus considered HPA? So uh, my my dog Carmen uh, uh, thinks that maybe this HPA is to is to pull the the genome from the replication center. It's not really HPA is to package inside the capsule. So maybe it's the same uh, fun function or role for this virus. All right, thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Okay, so the next speaker is getting set up is Andreas Kuhn, who's going to talk about the bacteriophage entrance in assembly machine. And is an is an, is an oligomeric ring in the in the membrane um, of E. coli. Um, yes. All right, so we are now going to the filamentous stage. So um, let's see. This is our castle. Looks also nice, and the devil is actually nicer than in England. <laughs> okay, oh yeah, it's a very sensitive. So the filamentous stage uh, is a fascinating thing, actually. And uh, what you see, just uh, last month there uh, was the first. Um, the first uh, cryostructure published of the, of the particle, and you see the tip of the page. Um, it's uh, down to a resolution of 2.8 angstroms. And this page extrudes actually from the membrane of E. coli. So you see long filaments growing out of the cell. And the assembly takes place in the inner membrane of E. coli. So you can visualize this nicely by AFM, and it really looks similar as the cryostructure. <laughs> okay, so how is this assembly occurring? Um, first, a little bit about the genome of the page. You see, it has only nine different genes expresses 11 proteins, and for instance, this gene 1 has an internal starch codon in the same reading frame, so it expresses actually two different proteins, as also does the gene 2 expresses the second protein. That's why it has only nine genes and makes this astonishing reactions in the cell. So uh, the tip of the page encodes the uh, or has uh, two different uh, tip proteins. And then you have thousands of coat proteins along the filament. And at the base of the virus, you have uh, the attachment proteins, which infect only male E. coli cells. So they appear at the tip of the S pilos. Then how infection occurs is that the pilos retract as you can see here. So that's the tip of the pilos. The pilos attracts, it retracts into the 
uh, in the membrane and as the page at the tip also comes down, it partitions the code proteins partition into the inter in the membrane and can be reused in the assembly. And but this frees the single stranded DNA. The single stranded DNA then is completed to a double strand, is transcribed and replicated. After replication, you see some um, single stranded proteins which are covered by a protein, GP5. And this single stranded protein then engages at the membrane and uh, the new progeny particles um, are assembled with cold proteins in the inner membrane and are extruded through the periplasm, through the outer membrane, into the medium, and then the new particles appear in the fluid. So that's the life cycle of this uh, virus. And most of these proteins, actually, all these 1, 3, 6, 7, 9, and 11, are membrane proteins. So the first go into the membrane and the assembly occurs uh, simultaneously with the secretion of the whole viral particle. We were interested now how this actually works. And this um, gene 1 protein, which is uh, actually transcribed together with gene 11, is the assembly motor. At the, in the membrane. That's the only, these only two proteins, 1 and 11, do not appear in the viral particle. They stay behind in the, in the membrane. So, uh, you can observe actually the secretion by AFM, nice technology, <laughs> that you uh, can, uh, five minutes after infection, you see. Um, only few uh, phases coming out, and 10 minutes is, is going to really increase in number, and 60 minutes you see all over the viral particles are really secreted all over, so it's a very active process. Cells never lie, so <laughs> it's just some kind of sexual disease of E. coli. Okay. So, how does assembly occur? So, this is the model published by Kay and Lipko. So, you see the single stranded DNA coated with GP5 coming to this assembly machine, the P1, P11, binds the single stranded DNA and accepts the different code proteins coming laterally into the membrane somehow sneaking through into this assembly machine. What is known structurally is the outer membrane path. You have a huge secretin-like protein which has actually 60 beta sheets in the outer membrane. And this uh, traverses the particle which is assembled in the inner membrane and then secreted through. So we went on cloning this uh, uh, CP111 on a plasmid and expressing on um, in an interest in an E. coli cell. Then you get the proteins. You can add a his tag either at the N terminus or at the C terminus. If you add it on the N terminus, it's the only the CP1, the long one. But if you have it on the C terminals, you see both. So, um, of course, um, since uh, the his tag at the end terminals leaves uh, the C terminals without his tag, this tells you if you isolate it, the, the protein by the his tag affinity, you only get the, the big one. You lose somehow the small one. But if you have the small one, the they, they stick together and it's more stable. So, um, you can see this also, of course, by the Kumasi stain, and that the both proteins are then uh, present. Okay, the GP1 has uh, an ATP 
binding site walker A and walk, walker B box, which are essential for fake uh, assembly, and they are localized in the cytoplasm of this complex. So, um, um, GP11 does not have this uh, ATP ace uh, um, domain. So, um, Yeah, we had we, I think. Yeah. We purified uh, this uh, protein for so GP1 and 11, and uh, uh, we constituted into liposomes. So the, the proteins then uh, form some kind of oligomer, as we think. And uh, um, we can, of course, uh, also look onto the isolated proteins, how they look like, but also in, uh, in the um, proteoliposome, that the functions actually at least for binding the DNA. So, um, leaning in the lab, um, purified single-stranded DNA and purified also the TP5 protein, as has done 30 years ago by Ruth Cummings already. So, and he characterized this nice complex uh, single strand DNA and CP5. And we use this now to look whether it can bind to the uh, complex of um, TP111 uh, embedded in the proteoliposome. And uh, this shows here that uh, she was able actually to, just by sedimentation, that um, the TP5. It stays back in the supernatant uh, if you have no single stranded DNA in liposomes or in the proteoliposomes. But you have, if you have it bound to the single stranded DNA, you find it in the pellet, but only if you have CP111 present. Which you also can okay, this tells you that. Uh, we constituted TP111 binds the single stranded DNA. And uh, we have now a model such that uh, uh, TP111 oligomer accepts the single stranded DNA as a first step. Then the uh, tip proteins, TP7, uh, TP9, come in, swim in somehow laterally and bind on the tip, so they form the tip of the virus. And in the next step, uh, many of the coach proteins, actually 2,000 copies per, more than 2,000 copies per particle, come in and somehow put this on a layer as the particle turns out and is depleted both through the uh, ultimate brain. Yeah, you can visualize these uh, um, oligomers um, on, uh, on an EM. You see fine all over these particles. And um, if you collect, you can see that it's probably pentameric, could also be hexameric, so it's difficult to say from this stage, but it's ready to go for final EM now. <laughs> So this is uh, the, um, actually by Rebecca Connors. She has also um, in the Wiki Gold Lab. She uh, also saw the prior structure of this outer membrane secretin, and uh, uh, also beautiful work. And we look forward that she also now uh, saw this uh, structure of the. In a membrane assembly machine, which has an ATPase here down here, and somehow uh, move the DNA and code uh, with proteins coming laterally in into the grow, growing page uh, particle, then passing through this outer membrane secretion and it's released in the middle. Okay, you can see here also. Nice uh, um, secreting cell, which uh, has recently been done uh, by an amber mutant we have in CP1. And uh, now the, the, the 
page grows because we have a plasmid inside which you can turn on and then of course you get a signal that now decreases the page by just adding IPDG and <laughs> then uh, you see um, he's drawing a page out of the cell in this case that it's expressed from the plasmid. Uh, expressing uh, the code growing genes from the plasmid has another further advantage that you can label specifically one end. For instance, you insert some tags, HA tag we put in here into GP9, for instance, and then label the gold particles. You can label the tip of the page, and this would actually help also in the reconstituted system to really follow the uh, growing page particles out of the cell and demonstrating that they are actually rotating via secretion out. Maybe this is possible in the future. And uh, uh, yeah, this is just my uh, female cell, which so females are not secure even in the E. coli because you can use transsexual of the uh, viral DNA and uh, transfect the DNA into the cells, female cells, and then uh, they even don't have PI, so they are also then, of course, it's secreting the page without having to deal with the whole uh, infection process. So they are just secreting the page without the exodus, which is also possible. Okay, this is um, the people doing the work. Max is the assembly machine mainly, and Luke Kessner is the expert of the ASM. Uh, then you work, on, of course, with these um, uh, insertion proteins, which the code proteins use, like the UC and the SEC uh, apparatus. So we, there's a lot of uh, work going on, which I didn't tell you about today. And we also work on T4 and T7, so some of the work is presented by Sabrina in the lab. And look at post 15. So um, one more thing is that last, uh, yeah, last year we made a memory issue in viruses. Um, so we have um, many um, particles appeared in, the, in this um, Special issue of viruses. So we uh, decided, actually, the, the journal decided to make a second round, and we have now a new uh, deadline for a second uh, volume in the, to the memory of Lindsay Black that we uh, accept uh, articles and we get a reduced price for publishing. This is, of course, an opportunity for everybody in the audience to uh, get a nice entry into this memorial issue. So, thank you very much. Questions? Thank you. Very, very interesting. Um, I was just kind of curious about the um, lipid component of the system. Is there anything known about, like, are there specific lipid species or specific um, head groups of that tail type that are needed or more permissible for this or is it all mystery? Well, you don't find the lipid in the page particle. But of course, the lipid is very important to get integration into the bilayer. And the code proteins are really in the bilayer as membrane proteins. Uh, Interestingly, they also oligomerize. The code protein oligomerizes after it has left the interface, the YC. It's dependent on YC, so it oligomerizes uh, after it leaves the, the insertion device. And then it's ready to go, I guess, as a, some kind of as a, as a two dimensional <laughs> layer into the assembly machine. But how this occurs is, of course, an interesting thing. If you think about the assembly machine being pentameric, this would explain that we have 
five entry slides into the assembly machine from the bilayer that they can swim in. And then if you turn in the DNA just by ATPase, you might just code the, the, the DNA and, and uh, generate the particle. Same time scale. More questions? <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's working some kind in the cytoplasm, but what it really does, it's not known. It's not, it's not acting on this thing or something. This I wouldn't say, but not as a uh, um, uh, uh, redox phase, let's say. Yeah. One more question? Four or five E. coli cells that are secreting the virus out. Super naive question in the sense that do you think there is a polarized release of the virus, especially when you have cells sort of you know sticking to each other, then you get the virus coming out and be selectively from one side? Or do you think this is just, and if this is an active process, or whether the virus secretion is just physically blocked at the interface of cells? Ah, yeah, well, I, I guess so. If, if you have dividing cell, you mean? Yeah, if you have a dividing cell, of course, you have this FTS ring and so on. So it, it's probably just steric. But uh, usually, if you have a non dividing cell, the contagious secret all around, even on the pole. Yeah. Uh, yes, I have a question. Yeah? So you are really missing uh, a carry plastic. You only have an inner membrane and an outer membrane. How do they find each other? That's not really true because the TP4 protein is quite uh, uh, long in and reaching into the periplasm. So you can connect it. Yes, and it has been shown by Marjorie Russell early on that the two, the TP4 and TP1, somehow interact. Yeah. Oh, and a couple of questions. Is the diameter of the elementus page consistent with the core and those rings you see? The ATP and things you see in the Yeah, yeah. So it, are you saying it's kind of like a DNA translocation? Yes. Yeah. Right? Yes, so I would say so. so. Any yeah. thoughts on how the proteins come in from the side? <laughs> <laughs> well, we just know they have all transmembrane regions. Some might even have two. And uh, we started them as membrane proteins, so they are, you know, have a defined topology, and, uh, and the topology is somehow organized by just the blanket part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So we could use, of course, this uh, proteolithosome system to address now the method, you know, how the proteins would go in into uh, this uh, assembly machine. Yeah, it's basically it's possible to do this. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I have one more. Here. Uh, <laughs> uh, so beautiful work. Uh, love seeing the cells and secretion of the uh, the phages. So this uses uh, obviously it's it likes mineral cells, right? In thirteen. Yeah. How does um, uh, certainly other phages could use uh, Phyllis? And certainly they're out there, whether we know about them or not. Um, how is S. Phyllis expression affected when these are secreting all these M13 particles? Is there a way to possibly silence or prevent other phages from... Well, yeah, that's an interesting question. We never thought about it. <laughs> Probably it's silence, yeah. Yeah. You see, how do you know? So <laughs> <laughs> Ian's data from 19. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. So we're going to go to the last, last talk. Um, so 
discussion before lunch. Um, I guess um, everyone reaches an age and they realize they're the oldest person in the room. I think I'm almost there. So I want to um, speak about uh, the 50th anniversary of uh, the discovery of Fly 6. Um, it's an interesting story. It's historical. Um, I'm assembling a special issue on this and um, I think if anyone wants to contribute to the field, it might be, might be worthwhile. So, 50th anniversary. And the Cisco virus, whoops. The Cisco virus is a lipid containing double stranded RNA virus. It was discovered, obviously, 50 years ago in the laboratory of Ann Vitiver and James Von Etten at the University of Nebraska. And it's a pseudomonas that uh, infects the carbovice basal ecola as its host. And we considered it a model real virus for reasons that we'll look at momentarily. Um, and the capsid um, and assembly and the segmented genome selection packaging was a question of great importance to us, making it real virus like we think in some ways, same way the previous, the previous discussion um, had an image that I'll show again. Um, and the capsid assembly and segment and genome selection uh, packaging is, 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 is a question that still remains open to a great extent. Now, we also used it to look at genome reassortment, and most importantly, by work by Lenny Mindish, uh, recombination that I'll speak about, a work that it may, maybe is in, it may be sort of a splash once upon a time, not remember too much now but I think we should come back to it and we'll talk about why. Um, and of course, viral protein structure and dynamic interaction during virus maturation was important. And of course, there are environmental studies going on um, and fitness studies, they call it. And to some extent, to some extent, there has been intellectual property uh, developed for this system. Uh, this is a photograph of Anne Vitiver, who I understand recently retired. Here's James Van Etten, um, who I uh, recently got to meet by email as a consequence of a review article from the University of Nebraska. And the initial paper, according to Anne, uh, was, re was met by disbelief. Uh, and, and no one ever found a double-stranded RNA segmented bacterial virus. And in her short autobiography, she said, this paper is now part of scientific obliteration and is not cited. Um, that's a 1969 paper, um, and it, it was very curious, and we'll get to that. Now, this, of course, is Lenny Mendes, who sadly um, has had to retire in the last five years. Um, the work in New York um, was later the primary setting, and that in Helsinki. Um, we uh, had three floors in the New York City Public Health Research Building prior to public health moving to New Jersey, but I worked up here in one of these windows. Um, so it was a real New York place, and much of the work was also done by Dennis Stanford, and here's Dennis, uh, uh, sadly, he uh, stood in the wrong position for the poetry, so, you know, these things happen. Anyway. Um, and that, of course, was done in Finland. This is not Helsinki, it's Lapland, but it's a nice symmetrical photograph, um, so I like presenting it. Um, you have to know something about the uh, organization of, whoops, sorry, the organization of the virus. And it's multi, it's multi-layered. The outer layer, of course, is an envelope with integral um, and membrane proteins. And internal to that is a matrix of protein P8. Internal to that is a dodecahedral capsid. Um, and internal to that are three double-stranded RNAs, of course, drawn schematically here. And you momentarily uh, just saw this image uh, in regards to the real virus talk. 
where you can see as the packaging of single-stranded RNA takes place, um, the capsid expands and the portals are not orbiting, orbiting the structure, but are in some way attached to the procapsid as it expands. Um, the occupancy of these are not 100%. That's, not a, that's implied here, but it's not the case. And yet, when the virus is completely assembled with its pH matrix, it's indeed 100% occupied by P4. Question that still remains to be worked out. So, once the, uh, in the case of Phi 6, the first one discovered, it's male specific, it binds to the pseudomonid pili. It's drawn into the, drawn into the cytosol, the outer layer is removed and transcription of the double-stranded RNAs take place, which are then subsequently packaged, pardon me. So the um, early function is a polymerase in this case, the polymerase complex. And if we look at the three segment genomes, and by the way, I should mention that this is 40-year-old work, that it, it took us several years. This would probably be done overnight now. But it took us several years to get this uh, um, uh, cDNA sequence established. And there were common sequences on the end. I blew up the, the very end. The large, in general, with some exceptions, has GU. The other GG, GG. This has something to do with the temporal regulation of the transcription. And the capsid proteins are on the L segment, while the later proteins are on the M segment and on the S segment. So there are three completely independent segments, making it essentially, essentially a bacterial real virus. And if we look at the earliest electron micrographs of phi 6, basically you say to yourself when you're starting, what does this thing look like? And these are negative, strain, uh, negative stains, and they're from Viterbur and, and in the Nathan's lab. And what's interesting about them is that we don't see very much detail but you soon do see a tail or a sac like tail like structure, which um, we were always discounting as artifactual, but from recent information, it's possible that they indeed do exist when the virus infects the pseudomoded host. And that remains to be worked out. Uh, oh, here we go. Okay. So then, of course, we had chloroform-treated electron micrographs to try to get a little better look, coming from Agus and Ellis and Shagel's lab. And um, you can see here that um, although it's chloroform-treated and one would expect just the envelope to come off, in actuality, we're really looking, and, and I now know, at, at pro-capsid. So the thing fell apart to a great extent. This is pretty rough preparation. But nevertheless, we're getting the idea of the layers. Here's a blow-up. There doesn't seem to be any particular region where the virus still was found, but we're still working on this um, uh, to some extent in my lab with Minute in Helsinki to see just where this virusome takes place using a carrier state system that we can talk about over here or, or something. Oops, sorry. Now, the greatest question, whoops, sorry again. The greatest question, well, could, if it's a real virus, do we have a conservative transcription? Alternatively, do we have a strand displacement system? And of course, you can work this out. It's, it's, it's very tricky in basic biochemistry, but the first strand pushed off is cold if you're labeling. So you have a strand displacement. You're not off the first plus strand to make the messages. So that, this is one of the basic, and this was done by Riemann and Hazelcorn in 1978. And, and then, whoops, sorry, and then, where was I? <laughs> was I here? Yes. And the light goes here. Okay. Um, so Lenny got into the picture, and he actually was first interested in envelope assembly. Um, but the real virus nature of it made it very interesting. So he did the very obvious experiment, and he just disassembled the virus. And the numbering of the proteins is based on the migration of the SBS page gel. You can see that in an infected and prematurely open cell, 
you can see nine structural proteins, P12, that has something to do with membrane acquisition. We'll talk about that. And P11, that is somehow associated with P5, but we're not entirely sure just yet. Lenny then went ahead and he selected nonsense mutations um, and, and, um, and so some misdense mutations using nitrosobonidine and fluorouracil. He was able to set up linkage groups and get a pretty fair idea of the linkages of the three segments. Um, again, and this is going back to 1975, I and mean, we're almost 50 years ago in this case, done by the very, very, uh, what would now look like crude methodologies. So with that, um, he was able to make a very rough assembly hierarchy. And obviously it's far more detailed now, and we can talk about that, and I'll show a picture later. But he knew that, well, P1 comes first somehow, then it assembles into some type of capsid structure. It assembles message sense RNA, which are then doubled up. And so you have four proteins constituting that. Now with RNA, lipid surrounding it, probably by protein P12, the non-structural protein. And then the integral membrane proteins, P10, that turned out to be a holon, and 5, which is the murine peptidase, and P11, which has something to do with five, but we're not really sure to this day. And then, of course, finally, the attachment apparatus goes on, which is not one third the diameter of the virus. This is just done for illustrative purposes. And that is P6 integral, and it holds on to P3, making the attachment apparatus. So the basic idea was in place by this time. And if we just walk through the basic, if we just walk through the basic ideas. Um, yes. Um, the envelope acquisition still remains unresolved in some minor ways. It can either come off the inner membrane. It's possible that a vesicle is formed and the filled pocapsid punches into it as if you were punching your fist into a soccer ball, um, or it somehow enters into it, or somehow lifted surrounds it. That could either be happening in the cytosol or the same idea in the two model could be happening off the inner envelope. And this is something that is not resolved to this day, and it might be worth worth um, exploring. Uh, I went in, oops. I came along uh, in, in, in about 19, uh, whatever, the 80s. And um, we decided we would assemble, because now recombinant biology was, was, was common, and we'd resemble a, uh, an empty propacid instead of a packaging assay. And so we were able to assemble the propacid. It's empty. It's unexpanded. Actually, you see three forms here. You see um, star-like ten-point ten point things, and you see hexagons, which, which suggest a dodecahedron in Helsinki. In Dennis's group, he was able to do sectioning, and this is E. coli cells completely filled with uh, procapsids. And then we wanted to see what the packaging signal is, and we did this in a very rough way at the time. And my idea was to simply take the segments, in this case M, and just nuclease digest off the 5' prime end, assuming it was there. So we did that, and basically if you go through this, you can see that it's yes, it packages, no, it doesn't. And when the no, it doesn't, it's because a rather large region, large region of the uh, uh, of five prime mRNA had been removed. So this is a very diffuse packaging mechanism. I had a very crude way of looking at packaging. I just correlated gradients with propactins and labeled RNA. And although it's not perfect, you can see it, it's certainly not efficient. It wasn't an efficient method to a great extent the labeled RNA did correlate with the procapsids in, in gradients. And if you were to do that with double-stranded RNA, which was not the precursor, you would see uh, that these were completely separate. Of course, the packaging assay uh, was done in a much better fashion by RNA projection protection later on. Oops, sorry. Do I have another minute or so? Um, so Oops, sorry, I'm... Um, what is it? 
Easter. So the packaging region is rather large, so it folds into, this is done in Dennis's lab, it folds into a two-dimensional structure. Um, so it's a very ornate form. And Lenny then went ahead and wanted to see what the direction was. So he packaged, but he placed a strong hairpin at the three prime end, and he made a block, and he was able to demonstrate it's going in the five prime direction. So these are, these are really clever experiments. And then the question was, how does selection take place? And selection takes place as one goes in, and you have the sequential expansion of the capsid. You reveal first the S segment binding site. It expands, N is revealed, it expands, L is revealed, and then it completely expands. And one neat trick was to link everything together into massive chromatin, and the whole thing went together and expanded from unexpanded to expanded in one shot. So this was an example of the sequential expansion and the RNA recognition sites in 1995. And then uh, Vesta Cola from, uh, from uh, Helsinki and I decided, well, if you could do a packaging reaction, maybe you could rescue a double-stranded RNA virus. Um, and as, as, as Paul uh, admitted yesterday, it made me feel much better that he's some has some foul ups with his graduate. Well, I got fired from uh, from uh, a leading influenza laboratory because I couldn't do the packaging reactions. So I decided when I went to Lenny's, I'll fix them and I'll try to do packaging reactions and rescue reactions in a double stranded RNA. And so Vest and I did the simplest thing possible. We just removed the PST1 site and we packaged it into the pro patches. We coated it with the PA matrix, and then we sequenced, and we saw that we got the deletion. And we had packaging, and we were happy because we thought we did a mighty technical treat. And, uh, then Lenny went ahead, and he found a new direction based on this. And if you look at this picture, he's using lactase and colorimetric selection here. You can see if he puts in a a, a, uh, um, a hairpin loop, a very strong hairpin loop, he gets an unstable virus. If he doesn't, in the middle segment, he gets a stable virus. And when he sees an unstable virus and replaques that, he restores stability to get a virus, and you can see that there was recombination, RNA recombination in the middle segment. Which was, which was a, a rather, I'll knock it off in a minute. Sorry. Sorry. But very quickly, very, very quickly, and I'll stop. Um, M recombines with S. M can recombine with L. S with M. But what's most important is that, and, this, and I think for today also, and we have to think about this for a variety of complex reasons, and certainly with coronavirus, is that there's a very limited, really, sequence homology. And that recombination can be performed very easily, even without much homology, essentially none. It's heterologous recombination. And uh, Lenny then went ahead, and we always felt there would be a niche and other viruses could be isolated. And you can see that he isolated more, more being isolated all the time. Basically, it gives us a mutant library ready-made. That means, in some cases, we all know some species you can crystallize proteins and some you can't. And so we had opened up, opened up the, entire, the entire field. And this is my last slide. And I just want to point out that a lot of different things, the, here's protein P1, was, was um, crystallized from phi, phi 8 and phi 6, and it's a trapezoidal type structure. Um, we looked at the, the portal, the hex, hexameric NTPase um, work with Roma, where we looked at deuterium exchange to see where it was binding to the propapsid. Um, in my laboratory, we tried to find out what the mysterious protein 7 was doing, and in my opinion, and what we thought, it might mount the P2 polymerase in the inner threefold axis, and then we used it later on, something that still has to be explored. There were some interesting issues about the P8 matrix um, in 5.6. 
In fact, in, 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 in Phi 8, it, it, it doesn't even exist, so there are questions about that. My laboratory went ahead and looked at Phi 12, which binds to lipopolysaccharide, and we saw that instead of having a simple dimeric binding site, you actually had a hexameric site that was composed of two proteins. There was an initial open reading frame called B that is not associated with it, so I made a mistake. So I just left it and called it 3AC. But it's a complex hexameric structure. And all this data allowed the group in Helsinki to reestablish and refine the assembly model, um, which still uh, demands uh, some, some investigation. So finally, I, I have to say, say this. Um, the collaborators of the past, so just bear with me for another minute. Um, the Braxton group, of course, is important. And I have to mention Myron Kendall Brackey. He did a lot of early work with Van Etten and Vidver, and he turned down authorship because he worked for the uh, Department of Agriculture. He thought they would talk, take offense. It was a different time. No one would do this now. So he really deserves, deserves assembly. Long gone now. And um, bacteriophage assembly with Mingus in the Bamford Laboratories. Uh, RNA protein recognition, and, uh, and sadly, uh, I couldn't find a photograph of Helen Rebell, who did a lot of the early work on sequencing and protein identification, including Anderson's protein that, that demands another look. And um, here's pictures of a few more people. This is John Denhe, who attended this, this lecture uh, many years ago, and he's, um, this is a photograph from the New York Times. He's actually isolating coronavirus from sewage samples now um, and, and making some very interesting observations. This is Paul Turner at Yale, who's looking at fitness, fitness and evolution in 5.6 and now also by therapy. And of course, here's the gang, Reza, who I'm working with very closely. Basically, he's extending my, my career as we work together on adenovirus and other structural elements. Roman, of course, Mina and, and and Sarah right here, who I've shown so I can KA a little bit, and maybe they'll help me write some review papers. So, so um, thank you very much. I'm sorry I went over. Thank you. So we have time for one question. No questions? Okay. So we're going to have a coffee break, Victor? Uh, right, yes. Yeah, so. A couple of very quick 